Hi, I'm here in charge to introduce you to the neural nets and the basic structure that compose them called the perceptron or artificial neuron. So I'll first talk about which tasks we try to solve with this unit called perceptron and how we make it more complex by composing it to build what's called a neural net. So for those who have done some course on machine learning, this will be already familiar. Um, we have three types of tasks in machine learning, basically, and I'm focusing on the supervised learning task. And as Marta said, we're not writing programs here, but letting the system learn by itself from data. And in this case, we try to learn a mapping function f from x data points we have in the space to y, to responses. And to do so, we have some input-output pairs that tell the system examples as we learn, like seeing pictures of dogs and cats. It learns in the same way, somehow. And you, throughout the course, you also see some examples of unsupervised learning, but reinforcement learning will not be seen in this course. Um, okay, now, from this mapping function, depending on whether we have continuous or discrete outputs in the Y, in the mapping, we call this regression or classification. Regression would mean maybe predicting temperature, and classification predicting categories like words, or classes like, what do we have in this image? Dogs, cats, what's set? Hello, goodbye, things like that. And to motivate it for the course, for the scope of this course, we have, for instance, as a regression, the text-to-speech task, where we have the input data, text. We have some feature extraction, like counting words, transcribing to phonemes from text, etc. And that's mapped through the regression module to continuous variables for instance, spectrum samples, maybe, and that's converted to through waveform generation. So this is important, the handcrafted thing, this is the classical pipeline of machine learning up to the current moment in time, and you'll see why in two slides. And the classification motivation could be automatic speech recognition, maybe, where we go the other way around, from waveform to words. And again, we extract some features, map them through the classifier, and we have the words. Let's put it that simple, maybe. What happens with the deep stuff, what, means, what, what deep means, and I introduce it here, is basically merging the blocks of learning features. So rather than extracting features, handcrafted features, we'll learn them, let the system learn them, as well as the classification, maybe. Classification or regression. So the, the discrimination task is learned together with the feature extraction task. And that's what deep means, letting the system learn by itself and composing the full pipeline in an end-to-end -end approach such that everything's optimized towards our end task. So, linear regression. This is the first task that we, that, that we can solve um, in the supervised learning methodology. We may have some data points, the red points, the noisy points, and want to feed a line, for instance, to um, to specify in every X point some Y output, some Y continuous output. And we can do so in 1D, for instance, with the weight and the bias. We estimate those parameters, then we fit this line, and we have some approach to what could be the value here, 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 whatever, based on the examples given by the red points. This can be extended to M dimensions of inputs. It doesn't have to be just a line, but a hypersurface. And there we can have, for instance, to predict the price of a house based on square meters, location, year, year of construction, etc. We place the weights and the bias, and then we build this uh, approximation of our data automatically in a learning phase that will be seen in further chapters. So, now moving on, what logistic regression means is transforming this approximation of a function somehow to predict probabilities. So, we have binary classification task. And we what, what we want the system to tell us is whether we have maybe a dog or a cat or whatever with a certain probability out of a set of inputs. So this image corresponds to a dog or this uh, speech piece of signal corresponds to the word hello. This can be given in a binary fashion by this sigmoid function here. We have the, let, let's have a look at this. This uh, exponent here is basically a linear regression approach, and on top of that, we build this piecewise function that's a nonlinear mapping that converts 
the real numbers in the space to probabilities. So what we would have is, in the logistic regression approach, having the clouds of data points for the two classes would define with this linear equation the boundary between the classes. The weights would be the orientation of this boundary. Let's imagine not a line, but a hyperplane in many dimensions. So this orientation and the bias would be the offset we have for this plane to be moved. And then we place the sigmoid transformation and this becomes a probability hypersurface where these points are closer to one and this one's to zero. So it's a ridge built in the space. And this is how we could build a binary classifier. These two tasks can be expressed in terms of this little graph and this is called the perceptron or artificial neuron. What we have is the set of inputs, a weight per input that multiplies every input, and then we sum up everything together with the bias, and we have some activation function. And depending on which kind of function we have, it's either linear or nonlinear, so we have the behavior I've taught you. Well, and this can be seen as an analogy to the natural neuron, as seen here. The natural neuron is basically a set of synapses giving some impulses, and when the sum of the inputs is over a threshold, it spikes some signal. So it works similarly with the sigmoid function, where over a threshold is one, and, uh, and under that threshold is zero. So once again, engineering takes inspiration from nature. And now, I've talked about binary classification, but this is obviously extendable to multi-class classification, because um, maybe we have 10,000 words to predict out of a of, uh, of, um, speech signal, not just one. And to do so, we just have to arrange the natural extension is arranging many of these neurons in parallel, having the nonlinear activation that gives us a probability per neuron. But to, be, to, to do it well, we are predicting a PDF, a probability distribution function. So we have to normalize all those probabilities, the individual ones, such that they sum up to one. And to do so, rather than using sigmoid, so there's like a sigmoid activation per unit, but then we normalize all them all together, and this is called the softmax. So when you have to classify, multi, so to do multi-class classification on your output layer, then you have this kind of output with the softmax activation function. Note that here, there's no bias summing, but it's because the bias is in the, in the first place of the vector, so x of zero is one, it's constant. So the scalar product has the bias inside the weight vector. That's a detail, but many times you will see the equation expressed like that. Rather than having the bias separated in a sum, you have it included in the weight vector. Okay, so this is fairly simple, as we have a single hyperplane to separate our data in the space. But what happens, for instance, with this function, the XOR? We have X1 and X2, the input features, and they can go from zero to one. The XOR has a shape like this. It has the two mountains, one, one, when, when X1 and X2 are either zero, one or one, zero, and zero, zero in the other cases. And here you cannot simply place a single plane to separate, to discriminate the data. What happens is that we have to include some let's say intermediate processing layer, some complex mapping in between our inputs and the decision, such that the decision layer has an easier life to decide. And to do so, we place what's called a hidden layer of neurons. So now, this is what composes a neural net, the structure of having a first hidden mapping with non-linearities, this squeezes and stretches the space as needed um, in the learning phase such that when the weights are set up after training that you will see, our network first makes a mapping that's good for the output to decide whether this is, so the XOR function can be solved by means of this more complex intermediate mapping and the output has a linearly separable uh, data space. So this is an XOR, these are trained with the weights an XOR neural net. So, to show it more generically, this is what the neural net architecture is. And the important thing here is that, well, we call this fully connected architecture. And why do we so? Do we do so, yeah. Uh, we call it like that because every neuron has a, as input all the previous neurons from the previous layer. And this is important because as you make the the width of the network larger, the number of parameters, 
grows very quickly, as you can calculate here, because every layer can be expressed as a matrix of weights and a vector of biases, one per neuron. What we do is number of inputs, number of units, and that conforms the matrix. And then we sum up the bias, so we have bias number of parameters as well. And this is the amount of learnable parameters per every layer. So you can compute the total amount of parameters of a, uh, of a network computing per every layer and summing up all together. So layer one, layer two, layer three, you sum up everything and you get the amount of parameters. And this is how you express uh, the generic equation of a neural network with the set of uh, weights and biases. And some important remarks I wanted to give to you from this introduction is that we can put as many hidden layers as you want, you will get, but you will get more and more and more parameters. And you have to be aware of that because you may need a lot of data to let it learn automatically from that. And there is no formula to know the right amount of parameters, the right amount of layers and hidden units. It's just a trial and error, as you will see. And also, very important, the power, the power of neural nets comes from, from this nonlinear mapping that has in between. So you always have to place these nonlinearities in the hidden layers, because otherwise it wouldn't be a nonlinear mapping composing many functions, but just a, 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 a single linear mapping. So you can place sigmoids, 10H, leaky relus, whatever. These, these kind of nonlinearities, you will see them along the course. Up to now, I've talked about this one, but it's important to place some nonlinearity because otherwise it wouldn't be a hidden layer. And to conclude, I will talk about now that that we have su supposedly we have a trained system with some specified weights and biases. We want to assess the quality of this system so to know how well it does the regression or how well it does the classification. In terms of regression, normally these metrics come from the task itself. So for synthesis, we may want to check the error in the spectral prediction, etc. And we will see these metrics in, in the chapters where they are needed. But in terms of classification, it's a more generic thing because we have categories predicted. So what we usually do is we build a confusion matrix. And this system is basically uh, mapping the predictions we have from our, from our network, remember it's, it's parameterized, so it's learned. And it, it's supposed to be doing well. So we want all this diagonal to be filled up and the others to be zero because we have, our, we, we have a set of data where we evaluate with input-output pairs. So some examples to test, we call. And then out of that, we know these labels, this supposed to be predicted. And this is what predictions are actually. And so we map them to, to, to such that the networks say, this is, there are 12 class one predictions where there was supposed to be class one, but there are three class one predictions where there was supposed to be class two and so on. And we fill this up, but we're mainly interested on the diagonal and the others want to be zero because those are the correct predictions. And the binary case, this is reduced to four, uh, for parameters which are called the true positive and true negative, so those are the correct predictions. But then we have the false negatives and false positives. And out of these matrices we take the following uh, evaluation metrics. The first one is accuracy, it's quite typical and you might see it a lot in classification tasks. And it's basically about, the, it's the ratio between the diagonal, how many correct we have, over all the other ones, basically. The portion of correct above um, all the options we have. And in the binary case, we can have some other sophisticated metrics that take into account not only the correct hits, but the quality of the hits, to say it somehow. Because we may have, for instance, a, a problem of fraud detection and there we may have little classes of, yeah, it happened, a fraud was, was there, and a lot of no classes. And this unbalance can be against us in the accuracy measurement. Because, because if I always say, no, there wasn't, I'm hitting maybe 90% of the times. If I have a 90% a of no's and 10% of yes in the test, I would say it 90% of the times correctly. So we can say, okay, let's take into account maybe precision and recall, 
which consider not only the amount of hits but the quality of them by means of retrieving how many relevant hits we have and what's the quality of those hits. And this measurement derived to this curve where we have we, we assess our quality by means of maximizing the proximity of this curve to this point, one, one, in true positive rate and false positive rate. So maximizing the hits of these two values, we want to make the area under the curve the maximum. So making this approach here. And this, the, 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 the one line wouldn't be the correct. So it has to be always above, normally and as close to the 1-1 one, one as possible. So that's it. Well.